Jesus. The final order of business will be resolution and postal naming bills. I ask unanimous consent that these resolutions and bills be considered and blocked and read and open for amendment at any time. The resolution and postal naming bills include, you want, Clark, you want to read them? Yeah. You have them? Yes, sir. H Res 1036 recognizing the contributions of Korean Americans to the United States. In block. H.R. 4214, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 45300 Portola Avenue in Palm Desert, California as the Roy Wilson Post Office. H.R. 4547, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 119 Station Road in Cheney, Pennsylvania as the Captain Luther H. Smith U.S. Army Air Forces Post Office. H.R. 4628, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 216 Westwood Avenue in Westwood, New Jersey as the Sergeant Christopher R. Herbeck Post Office Building. H.R. 4624, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 125 Kerr Avenue in Rome City, Indiana, as the specialist Nicholas Scott Hartke Post Office. Have, having satisfied the committee's criteria, each of these measures are worthy of support, and I therefore urge their adoption. Does the ranking member have any comments at this time? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have reviewed these postal namings and resolutions and find they meet the requirements of the committee and move, move their endorsement and positive vote. And thank you and yield back. Any other members seeking recognition? I ask unanimous consent that the measures previously described be reported favorably to the committee without objections. So ordered. Finally, pursuant to Committee Rule 8, and in consultation with the affected members, I am appointing Mrs. Chu to the Subcommittee on Information Policy, replacing Mrs. Watson, and the Subcommittee on National Security, replacing Mr. Cuellar. And I yield to the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I certainly approve of these uh, changes, uh, considering the retirement of Ms. Uh, Watson. I look forward to working with the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu, on, uh, on these and other issues. Uh, and, and, Mr. Chairman, if I can also bring up at this time uh, the uh, agreement we've had on uh, setting a standard. You, yeah. you, you Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You Briefly, my understanding of the common agreement is that from this day forward, the committee shall schedule its field hearings and any other activity that might be considered or viewed to be electioneering or in some other way beneficial to a member uh, with, who is going to be on the ballot, either in the primary or in the general, that we shall limit those events to at least 45 days before that election, unless mutually agreed by the chairman and myself that for some reason it makes sense to go forward and that it is not material to that election. That's essentially my understanding of the agreement, which I fully endorse. Right. And I accept it. No, um, any comments on it? Let's move forward. Okay. Do any other members wish to speak? I ask unanimous consent that the measures previously described be reported. This concludes our business for today. I am I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered, reported without objections, so ordered. Uh, the committee now stands adjourned. And we will recess for five minutes to set up for the hearing that we have on prostate cancer. We resume.
battle the fuck out of my secondary snap. You don't have problems.
committee will come to order. Good morning and thank you all for being here. Prostate cancer is the second most common type of cancer found in American men. The first being skin cancer. It is also among the leading cause of cancer death in men, second only to lung cancer. One man in six will get prostate cancer in his lifetime, and one man in 35 will die from it. The good news is that the death rate of prostate cancer is declining. The bad news is that we still don't know what causes it. We still don't know why African American men are more likely to get it, and we still don't know why it seems to be most prevalent in North America and Europe. But most importantly for today, there is still controversy over whether men should be screened for prostate cancer and, where, and there are still questions about how it should be treated. We are hoping to shed some light on these questions today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the important role my colleague, Representative Elijah Cummings from Maryland has requested this uh, hearing and uh, also helping to ensure that these issues get the attention they deserve. And I would like to give him a special thanks for that as well. I also want to welcome to our hearing today Mr. Lou Gossett, a Brooklyn, New York native. Uh, Mr. Gossett is very well known for his work in the film industry and has been widely recognized as one of the great actors of our time. What is not well known is that he has been diagnosed with prostate cancer, and Mr. Gossett has agreed to testify today to help bring attention to the issue. I want to thank you for that as well. We also have Ms. Betty Gallo, widow of our former colleague, uh, Congressman Dean Gallo, who I served with, who died from prostate cancer. And we have all with us also Mr. Thomas Farrington, a 10-year prostate cancer survivor and who has done a lot of work in this area uh, as well. There's a high degree of public awareness of the need for regular screening for certain kinds of uh, cancers, notably breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. However, this widespread belief is now being debated. A few months ago, the New York Times reported that some scientists had concluded that the benefits of detecting many cancers, especially breast and prostate cancer, uh, have been overstated and that regular screening might not do as much harm, uh, might do as much harm as good. This has caused widespread confusion, which we hope to clear up today. To help us do that, we have assembled some of the leading medical experts in the country to discuss the latest thinking on screening and treatment of prostate cancer. I look forward to your testimony today because this is a very, very important issue. And again, I thank my colleague Elijah Cummings for uh, uh, making certain that we move forward with this discussion. Uh, now I yield to the gentleman from California for his opening statement, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, holding this important hearing today. Uh, and I'd like to echo your comments about uh, uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Cummings. Last year, he approached me to ask for us to work together on a bipartisan basis on this legislation. I accepted, and I, again, thank him for his leadership. As the chairman said, prostate cancer affects 2 million American men living here every day, including one of our witnesses. More importantly, when there is confusion as to what to do about it, even after decades of improvement in survivability, as there is with prostate cancer and also breast cancer, it's very clear Congress has a role to hold these types of hearings and fact-finding to reach, if at all possible, either a consensus on an outcome or a consensus on direction. I hope today is the beginning of that process so that we can provide guidance to the administration and to the healthcare industry about what the message should be. We are not healthcare professionals here at the top of the dais. We do not intend to become that. What we do intend is to try to help make the message clear and understandable to 306 million Americans, slightly less than half of whom are men, but all of whom are concerned with the effects that will happen to themselves or loved ones and the possibility of preventing it or early detection leading to a cure. 
With that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to our witnesses and yield back. Thank you very much. And now I yield uh, to the gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member for scheduling the hearing. I realize we have witnesses that uh, have been waiting for a while. So, Mr. Chairman, I will submit my written statement. But again, thank you so very much for addressing this very crucial issue. With the objection so ordered. Will the witnesses stand? We always swear our witnesses in. So if you stand and raise your right hand. You're an exception. Yeah. Do you solemnly swear to affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Yes. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. So, uh, Dr. DeWeese, we will start with you first. Chairman Towns, uh, Ranking Member Issa, and honorable members of the committee, uh, af good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. And let me also say thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for accommodating my schedule. I do need to get back to Baltimore to see actually my prostate cancer patients this afternoon, so I do appreciate this opportunity. Um, I do care deeply about my patients with prostate cancer, and I'm committed to doing what I can to improve their health and life. Uh, by way of background, I'm a professor and chairman of the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Johns Hopkins University, and I'm also professor of urology and oncology. For more than 15 years, I've dedicated my life to the treatment of men with prostate cancer and have treated over 2,000 men diagnosed with this disease. I also have directed a laboratory at Johns Hopkins over the same period of time and am intimately involved in research to develop new tests to diagnose prostate cancer and therapies to effectively treat the disease. I've published more than 150 scientific articles, abstracts in these areas, and I believe these experiences provide me a unique perspective on the problem of prostate cancer and the need for improvements in imaging, genetic analyses to enhance prostate cancer care. So my goal today is to provide a brief background on the gaps in screening and treatment approaches and explain why more robust research funding is needed in order to help our present and future patients. Major advances supported by federal funding have been in the, uh, made in the past 25 years to improve the care of patients with prostate cancer. The development of the PSA blood test has been one of the most important advances and serves as the primary means of screening men for the disease. The problem is that the PSA is not cancer specific, it is only prostate specific, such that changes in the PSA can occur for both cancerous and non-cancerous reasons, such as an infection. Moreover, the PSA typically does not indicate exactly how aggressive the cancer will be in any individual patient. This particular problem has produced great confusion for physicians and for patients alike. And while advances in our understanding of how to properly use the PSA test have been made, significant changes in the PSA level typically result in a biopsy of the prostate to determine if cancer is present. This is problem one. Some men do not need to be biopsied because they really do not have cancer, only an abnormal PSA. However, we cannot tell which patients have cancer from those that do not. And for those patients with cancer, we cannot tell which have the aggressive type that can be deadly. While the PSA test allows us to find some cancers earlier than we might without using the test, we find many cancers that would never have been a problem for the patient and do not need treatment of any sort. Put another way, prostate cancer comes in two general types. One is analogous to a domesticated kitten and the other to a dangerous lion but right now we cannot easily tell them apart. Now this is not to say our present screening and biopsy methods are useless. No, in fact, many men have had their cancer detected early enough to receive care that was life-saving. But this has been at a cost of finding many more men with cancer that never needed treatment. This approach is problematic because it exposes many men to unnecessary risk of treatment-related side effects. That is to say, we must find a way to ignore the kittens and focus our treatment on those deadly lions. At present, a biopsy of the prostate is the only definitive way to determine if the patient has prostate cancer and needles are placed through the rectum into the prostate to obtain that tissue. This is the second problem. Biopsies of the prostate are done in a blinded fashion. Unlike virtually any other organ we biopsy for cancer, we do not have effective imaging to guide the biopsy needles to suspicious areas of the prostate. We cannot see the cancer. 
Thus, it is very possible that needles placed into the prostate might miss the cancer cells. Even if the needles hit cancer cells in one area, the needles might miss a more aggressive cancer elsewhere in the prostate, which then goes undiagnosed, and thus the appropriate management for the aggressive cancer cannot be used. These facts demonstrate that our present approach can result in the overdiagnosis and overtreatment for many patients, the underdiagnosis in some men resulting in less optimal therapy because an aggressive prostate cancer was not biopsied, while some patients are left undiagnosed because the biopsy completely missed the cancer. Finally, our ability to accurately determine which prostate cancers in which patients are likely to be lethal is limited. Taken together, a strong case can be uh, made that significantly improved prostate cancer imaging and genetic markers are needed. Such imaging would allow us to avoid blindly biopsying the prostate. Instead, these images would be used to help guide the placement of biopsy needles to the suspicious sites. In addition, advanced imaging and analyses of blood and urine may allow us to actually determine if a patient has the type of prostate cancer that will never cause harm, avoiding treatment for such men, while allowing us to direct more aggressive treatment to those that will benefit by it. So despite these concerns, I am quite optimistic about the opportunities for our present prostate cancer imaging and genomic analysis that they will afford. Positive steps forward that I believe policy uh, planners should consider include an increase in NIH research funding to support prostate cancer imaging, genetic and biomarker research, and clinical trial development by at least 100 percent in these areas over the next two fiscal years support the creation of an NIH request for proposal that would specifically encourage study of imaging, biomarkers, and genetic analysis from patients that are in large patient networks uh, so that the uniform analyses of these techniques could occur. And lastly, to urge the NIH to make these initiatives a priority and request a public report on progress by 2011 that involves outside experts. So in closing, I will say I've had the great privilege of caring for thousands of men with prostate cancer, including several distinguished members of Congress. It's been a blessing for me, frankly, to see that most of these men are alive and doing well. However, not all of my patients have been so fortunate, and I wonder how much better their lives might have been if I would have had better imaging and diagnostic tools uh, to take care of them. Thus, on their behalf, I am compelled to ask you to support legislation that increases research funding for prostate cancer screening, imaging, genetic analysis, and therapy. And I thank you all for your attention and for your consideration. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. DeWeese. Uh, Mr. Farrington, good to see you. Yeah. Yeah, so. Chairman Towns and members of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, I am honored to appear before you today to address our nation's prostate cancer crisis as a 10-year prostate cancer survivor and having witnessed the death of my father and both grandfathers from this killer disease. Since my treatment for prostate cancer in 2000, I have worked nonstop to help educate others about this disease, including founding the Prostate Health Education Network in 2003 with a focus on African-American men who have the highest risk for being diagnosed with and dying from prostate cancer. There is an urgent need for clarity in the fight against prostate cancer today. The high visibility debate sparked by the PILCO screening study released last year has caused public confusion, elevating the risk of men most vulnerable to the disease. This confusion comes at a time when we have witnessed a steady decline in the prostate cancer death rates over the past decade which most attribute to earlier detection of the disease through PSA screening. These are some offense positions, concerns, and recommendations for the committee. The PICO study included approximately 10 percent of men at high risk for prostate cancer, which would be analogous to a study on lung cancer, which includes only 10 percent of smokers. Because of this and other factors in the conduct of the study, we do not believe that the results should be the definitive basis for national policies on prostate cancer but important data to be included with what is already known. We strongly support early detection and just as strongly disagree with any policies that would advocate men gamble with their prostates and their lives by not monitoring and knowing their prostate health through the use of the available tools. Today, those tools include screening via the PSA test and digital rectal examination. 
The federal budget for Prospect Council is inadequate to meet the education and awareness outreach needs and the research needed for new detection and detection procedures that are mandatory to move us beyond today's confusion. We recommend that the budget be equivalent to that of for breast cancer, a disease with comparable incident and death rates for women. Lack of access to treatment and lack of equal treatment where there is access are critical factors in the higher African-American death rate that need to be addressed. Expanded education efforts for the public and for doctors should be undertaken to address the problem of overtreatment of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is a medical, political, and economic issue. We are concerned that the short-term political and economic factors not be allowed to overwhelm and minimize the pressing medical needs. Prostate cancer can be beaten, and it is also a disease that can end in tragedy, which can oftentimes be prevented. My personal and family experiences illustrate this. In 2000, I was treated for prostate cancer after detection through regular PSA testing. Every six months since my treatment, I would get a PSA test, and in 2009, I had a disease recurrence. However, because of the early detection of this recurrence and my knowledge about treatment options, I am free of prostate cancer in 2010. I have been blessed with no side effects from any of my treatment because of early detection and knowledge. Ironically, because of Dave's confusion about screening, some survivors no longer believe they should be screened after treatment. A major step backwards, increasing the risk to those men who should be most on guard. While battling my recurrence last year, I lost two additional members of my family to prostate cancer. One my age did not get annual PSA testing. The other, my uncle, because of his age, was told by his doctor that he would die of something else before prostate cancer. They both suffered horribly and needlessly. I also had another uncle diagnosed and treated successfully for the disease during this time. Unfortunately, my family situation is not unique, but represents the real and chaotic multi-generation prostate cancer devastation within high-risk families across our country today. Black America is suffering a prostate cancer epidemic where men die at a rate two and a half times higher than for all other men. At what stage the disease is detected and with what knowledge determine whether we live or die and if we live, whether we have a good or poor quality of life. However, some of the policies now being advocated would accept this epidemic within black America as collateral damage. Chairman Towns and members of the committee, I sincerely thank you for addressing the prostate cancer crisis. We recommend that the policies and solutions for this significant health issue have a primary focus on those most in need and implemented with a sense of urgency, an approach taken with most other diseases of this magnitude. This is, an approach, this is an approach that we believe will better serve all men with a publicly clear, well-focused war on prostate cancer and a high level of leadership and priority within the federal government our nation can save countless lives, dramatically reduce suffering, and the overall impact of the disease. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Mr. Gossett. Yes, sir. Thank you for uh, accepting me here. Uh, I'm not a politician, so I'm not going to speak in any first, haven't prepared any speeches, haven't done that in years. I've spoken in front of a lot of uh, executives in the committee meetings in the Black Caucus and in the universities across America. I think that at this age, if I don't know it, I never will. I trust my heart and my experience. And I've been represented, hopefully, uh, uh, thank you for accepting me here. I will speak from my heart here. I went public with uh, uh, the fact that I have uh, prostate cancer. Uh, I, I had a little cancer in my kidney, and, and I lost the kidney. The operation took 20 minutes, and uh, they said that the other kidney would, would increase its size, and it did, and, uh, and a week later I was in the gym, and I was, I was, everything was fine. But now since I've gotten again, uh, I started to cancel some things in order to uh, take care of uh, the cancer instead of a lot of appointments. And the gossip began to hit. And the gossip is the worst thing there is. It's worse than, than AIDS sometimes. So in order to dispel all of the talks, I went public. Uh, I'm of a, a gentleman of service these days. And to serve all other people who have prostate cancer who like to keep it a secret, I came out of the closet and said so. And hopefully it helped a great deal. I got a great deal of emails and texts from gentlemen across the country 
thanking me for uh, being courageous to come out of the uh, public uh, service and, and encourage them to go take care of their doctors. Very ironic thing happened in some of them because they, uh, some of them around Louisiana, around California, and around New York and the different places, went to find a doctor that they can afford and could not find one. So there's a percentage of African-American men who do get it and they also cannot afford to, to, uh, to see a doctor. Uh, my heart goes out to those particular men. Well, I remember last time we had some kind of problem like this. When I was a child, you remember the polio epidemic. And what we did for the polio epidemic is we went to them with uh, a, a kind of a, we took care of everybody in America. And there was no debate in Congress about whether it was pro or con, we took care of everybody in America. Now this year, this time above all years, I believe that the playing field must be leveled. I think we're going in that direction anyway. Uh, so we must kind of take care of everyone in an equal American way. I'm concerned that uh, these facts that have been told to us in the other uh, meetings are, are, are true, that we lose an African-American man or two every day to prostate cancer. I think it should be modernized. I think uh, the mammograms have shown us that we can do the same thing with prostate if we give a little accent to that research. So that um, my mind is fairly creative. I have a book coming out next month, and I plan, since I can't travel so much on planes, to take a train and a bus and promote e-racism, which is my foundation, to try and level the playing field for our next generation. If we do not plant negatives in the next generation, they will grow up free of certain prejudices that we might not know we have. So I think this generation is in the insight of making sure we don't add to the problem, but add to the solution of how we can be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So by not planting that into our children, prostate cancer is one of those subjects. Uh, I can't imagine uh, this great country uh, being fought in, in our Congresses pro and con and eloquently about the fact that there's somebody in this country who cannot afford to take care of their health. Of all countries in this world, I believe that we should be the one exemplary, that everyone in this country should be able to go to the doctor. Uh, I have a, a child who I took when Jesse Jackson was running for president some 27, 25 years ago, and I found him homeless in St. Louis. And uh, at that time, we thought that every child should have, uh, in America should have free medicine, free education, free shelter, free food, free clothing, and free love. And I believe America is the foundation of that. Once you have that, then your thoughts go to a loftier thing. I think every American should have that. If, we, if there are African Americans, and I get these in emails, who can't afford to go to a doctor, and they know they might have some prostate cancer, then they feel like stepchildren. We have to get rid of our step stepchildren and educate them to be three-dimensional, responsible Americans. And we have to give them the signals that they are as equal and as loved as anyone else. Who The children of our stepchildren are gangbangers because they are planting a seed. They look at their fathers and see that they're not getting anything, and they say, well, I'm going to go this way. So I'm in those trenches trying to get these kids to be responsible. And my idea is to take th this bus that our president is talking about, putting uh, uh, an incentive into the bus and the train systems, Amtrak, promote my book, my foundation, and subjects like this to tell them that they also are three-dimensional Americans and to roll their sleeves up and be prepared to be responsible, all the neighborhoods. And out of that will come a sensitive thought of going into a, a clinics to uh, advance the study of, 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 of prostate cancer and other things so that we can realize in our minds that we are equal and we, are we have access to being cured. I find myself special, but those who are not special will not get this treatment unless we are more sensitive to their problem. And that's basically it. Today the subject is prostate cancer. Tomorrow the subject will be something else. But we're losing people that should be responsible in this country. That makes this country better. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gossett. Uh, Mrs. Gallo. I want to thank you, Chairman Townsend, and the committee for holding this very important hearing. 
Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today on a topic that has had a significant impact on my own life and on the lives of thousands of other men, women, and families. One of the areas that I felt that uh, we were lacking was the women and uh, according to a lot of the men they feel that the women are much more verbalizing as to talk about issues so what they have we have decided to um, create the women against prostate cancer which I am co-founder of and what our mission is is to unite the voices and provide support for the millions of women affected by prostate cancer and today I'm speaking on behalf of all women widows and caregivers whose lives have ever been changed by prostate cancer. As you mentioned, my husband, Congressman Dean Gallo, was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 1992. And unfortunately, he had a lot of pain in his, pain in his back, and when he went to the um, orthopedist, they did a bone scan, and he basically lit up like a Christmas tree. It was already into his bones. Uh, normal PSA is normally uh, four or less. His PSA was 882. Due to the fact that um, Dean was in Congress and was a little more familiar with what was going on as far as clinical trials, he did go to NIH and was enrolled in a clinical trial, and his PSA dropped from 882 in February of 92 to 3.5 the following March. He, at that point, had done other treatment options, and fortunately, he was, when he was first diagnosed, he was actually only supposed to live three to six months, and he survived two and a half years. And in that time, he still remained in Congress working with his constituents because he felt that's where his heart was. Um, there's some other stories I, I found that people, uh, younger people, uh, this woman, Jenny Taylor, and her husband were both physicians. Steve was 45. He had a PSA done. As a result, the PSA testing had found that cancer had spread through 70% of his prostate. They weren't, couldn't remove the prostate because it was, the prostate was too, um, cancer was spread. So Steve, in, through other uh, means, is now in remission. And they, then with three children, are enjoying their time together. But again, it's in remission for the time being. And how long that is, one doesn't know. Um, there are a lot of stories I've heard out there about people going through this, and now I'm finding that they're younger men. It's not older men. It's not an older man's disease. Women truly have a big concern, and it's being a caregiver to men that's, that's so important. And there's so many issues that come along with prostate cancer that sometimes it, it can create a lot of havoc in marriages because people just don't understand how to deal with the you know, uh, side effects. Um, more support in education is one of the things that I think is needed for partners and caregivers and the entire family. We really haven't done a good job in that area. A lot of people have no clue what to expect after a prostatectomy or how to deal with issues. And we really, this is one thing in the 15 years I've been doing this that I found that we really need to be doing more in. One of the areas I found that even in clinical trials, we don't really have any outreach component for money to be able to use that to go out and talk to people about prostate cancer, to let the community understand what clinical trials are and how we can help them. Many people are afraid of being guinea pigs, and that's not what we want them to see. We want them to understand that we have something there that could really help. Uh, early detection and appropriate treatment of prostate cancer, cancer remains a critical priority, especially among men at high risk because of family history, ethnicity, or other factors that define such risk. Physicians and male patients should be encouraged to discuss the patient's personal risk for prostate cancer and the individual need for prostate cancer testing. Men at higher levels of risk for prostate cancer, including the African-American men and men with a family history, should be encouraged to undergo appropriate tests at a relative early age. Additional funding is needed to increase outreach and promotion of the clinical trials, which I had discussed before. Uh, the PSA is not a perfect test, but it is all we have right now. I have been, as a woman, gone from mammography, and through all of this, I have found out that in this, where I had gone, 75% of the uh, a lot of the, um, not lumpectomies, but the, um, oh, I'm sorry, they had done the biopsies were 75% benign. So you have the same issue in breast cancer as we do in the prostate, but at least with prostate cancer, we at this point do have, this is the best we have. And one of the issues that concerns me is like in New Jersey, we have the um, Centers for Disease Control. We have 
prostate and breast and uh, cervical cancer, they pay for um, they pay for detection and they pay for treatment. In prostate cancer, they only pay for uh, for uh, for uh, the early detection. So, in other words, if they have prostate cancer, there's no way to treat them at this point. So, it's almost a, a, a crazy kind of a way to do things. And this is something that really needs to be corrected in that respect. Um, Screening should be provided in any health reform legislation. Uh, in New Jersey, we do pay for it for a DRE and a PSA because we find that it's very important for um, men to have it done and done with their insurance company. There is a lot of confusion today about prostate screening. And I think with the release of yesterday's prostate cancer screening guidelines from the American Cancer Society, there are now three sets of complex and, and differing screening guidelines, including those from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network and the American Urological Association. One clear set of guidelines is needed to make sure men know what steps to take and when in order to safeguard their health. For the past 15 years, I've been involved in the advocacy for prostate cancer. It has helped me through the process, the grieving process, and knowing how to be able to help other men and their families. As men and women in Congress, you are aware of what prostate cancer does to families and have experienced the loss of several colleagues to this disease. Increased education and awareness are the most critical issues. Chairman Towns and members of the committee, I would like to thank you for addressing this crisis. More, more needs to be done to help the thousands of men and women and their families across the country who are suffering because of prostate cancer. And we need to allow them to have a better quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. And let me thank all of you for your testimony. At this time, I will yield to the ranking member for questions that he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The next panel we're going to have will be physicians and specialists, researchers, but I think we were very fortunate uh, that uh, Dr. Uh, DeWeezy was able to speak first. And in looking through his testimony and, and some of the things he, uh, that uh, he provided us in written material, an interesting fact came out and one that I think as uh, survivors and, and in fact a, a, a victim of somebody who I appreciate that he survived two years, but in many ways, uh, you know, the loss is just as great no matter how much time you had to say goodbye. Uh, one of his, his facts that, that concerns me is that he says that uh, for every man who benefits from prost prostate cancer treatment, 30 to 50 effectively have no benefit. It, it begs a question that I would ask all of you, both as survivors uh, and, and, and a the, the widow of one, we put in about 300 million from NIH, another 80 million from DOD, and some smatherings of others into various forms of research. And you did say we should do more, but is, is this not a disease that effectively, until we aim better, a great deal of our treatment is by definition uh, a complete loss that, that if you have 30 to one in treatment, that there is a real risk that people are going through pain and suffering. Uh, and even when they say, you know, I'm a survivor, uh, the question is, are you a survivor of somebody who had cancer, but cancer that wouldn't have killed them versus uh, Mrs. Gallo's uh, husband, Dean, who the cancer clearly would. It was aggressive. It spread. Uh, differentiating those, coming up with a a, a much more targeted approach, both in lifestyle decisions, because it's one of the challenges we have. We apparently don't know what makes us more likely than European or African or other uh, people of, of our same DNA mix, but in other countries. But more importantly, the, uh, uh, the fact that we can't measure or, or predict. So no, no group could be more demonstrative of the people who would most likely disagree about cutting treatment, but I'd like you to, to look at, at these dollars, the federal dollars. Where would you have us put more dollars uh, if we only had a very limited amount? Would we put in three, four, five hundred million more into trying to get these better tests first? Well, uh, may I? Of may course. I? Um, it's a leading question knowing yeah. that, that well, everyone think, uh, would the, like... The way the well, way I've been, I've been educated, and I'm, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones, and those of us who have survived are one of the lucky ones, in finding the cancer in the prostate to those who have doctors who have access to the best is still 
like winning the lottery. Whereas on the other side, the women's, that least they have mammograms, they have sophisticated things that have made their, their, their science much more successful. I see more heroines in that. We need to catch up to them. And in order to do that, I think we need to, to concentrate our, our, our dollars, or your dollars, our dollars, uh, to those particular specialists who know how to sophisticate and find a, an equal to the mammogram to the, to the prostate sufferer. Because uh, the ones who fail because of our inadequacy of really pinpointing what it is, is, is a hit and miss. Mm -hmm. And I think we have the ability and the knowledge to really be better than that and save some lives. Yeah. Mrs. Gallo, would you concur with that? Uh, well, I, honestly, um, in the beginning when this all happened with Dean, the first thing I wanted to do was scratch everyone's eyes out that didn't do the have the PSA because I lost a wonderful man. And it's really been difficult to really understand why. Um, and again, when we talk about, you know, breast cancer, they have all sorts of testings. You know, you start with a mammography, then you go to another mammography if there's a problem. Then there's an ultrasound. There's an ultrasound biopsy. The hard part with prostate is you can't see the prostate. And so everything is kind of a guessing game. Uh, and I think that, you know, even if they say it takes 10 years for prostate cancer to really get to the point of where you're going to see it, Sometimes even doing a baseline at, say, an earlier age might be the way to go. You know, at least you can keep track of it that way. Um, I agree we need to put more money into uh, getting a better testing for prostate cancer, and uh, nothing's going to be 100 percent. And it's the same thing, I think, in a lot of uh, cancers. But at the moment, I feel it's something we have, and it at least has saved some people's lives. And I think no matter what cancer, there's going to be people that are going to die from cancer because maybe they didn't need treatment, and others are going to live. And I just think that, unfortunately, I think because we've always thought of prostate cancer as an older man's disease, we didn't really look at now how it's really affecting the younger population. So I agree we need to put more money in to be able to find a better way to you know, detect it, but also I... I personally feel that what we have is better than nothing at this point. Mr. Farrington. Yes, uh, Mr. Ice, I think there's an abundant amount of data that exists uh, that shows that uh, uh, what we do now does save lives. I think if you look at the decline in deaths since the PSA uh, was widely used, we've seen over 30 percent decline <laughs> in death rates. I mean, that is real. That's not theory. That is real. I sure, but Dr. DeWeese and I think the second panel, they spend a lot of time basically saying it's like the Hubble telescope. You know, it does give you a picture of, of, of the stars. Unfortunately, it's, it's insufficiently clear to be meaningful uh, to, to have only those people who have a treatable disease or at least close to only those people versus having 30 times as many people go through extensive treatment as receive benefit. I'm not disagreeing. I think, I think universally the early detection uh, and improving early detection we think is important. But then that's secondary, and I think Mrs. Gallo said it very well, are the tools today for prostate as good as they are for breast cancer? Once no. you think you might have something, the answer is no. I, I think if, if we were removing, doing radical mastectomies as we did in the 50s, on everyone who had a lump practically, uh, we, would, we, would, we would be horrified at the results. But that's what we used to do in breast cancer. We've come a long way. Mm -hmm. I guess the question as a survivor is, if I only have, if, if the, the Japanese will only loan us and the Chinese will only loan us another $1 billion this year for something related to prostate cancer, where would you put those dollars first if you were seeing the testimony we're seeing, such as Dr. Duisi's? And I ask you because you're the hardest people to make the decision that you'd put it into research or you'd put it into uh, a, a better detection or better differentiation versus treatment. And, and uh, Mr. Uh, Gossick, you, you said it fairly well. You know, there are so many people who don't have access, but it's tens of billions of dollars to incrementally improve the access to the underserved. And it's one of our challenges here. And one of the things that I've worked on with uh, the chairman here is prioritizing at least some dollars to the area that could, in the long run, cause 30 out of 31 people not to suffer needlessly. And those one to get the treatment early. Sure. I, I would, uh, you asked for two areas. Let me uh, respond, sir. One, I think in terms of research, and I think we do have to better focus much of our research. 
I think we know that there are some genetic factors uh, rel related to prostate cancer risk. And uh, I think there needs to be more research in the area of genetics and biomarkers, uh, uh, detection uh, uh, <coughs> procedures. Uh, we, I would put money there. Uh, the other area is in education and awareness. A lot of men really do not understand their risk level for prostate cancer. And when they're diagnosed with prostate cancer, they do not understand their options. Uh, and they don't know whether they should be treated or not treated. I agree that uh, every man should not be treated for prostate cancer that's diagnosed with the disease. But today, uh, people are not educated on those factors, so they will uh, many times uh, uh, move quickly to treatment when they should not be treated. So I would look at education and awareness and research into genetics and biomarkers, uh, and we've talked about imaging today. So I think those are critical areas. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the, um, first of all, I want to thank uh, you all for your testimony. And I just, you know, when we, I think we're constantly addressing the issue, and as, as we are doing it in the healthcare debate that we're now having in the Congress, um, exactly how do we take the resources that we have and spend them most effectively and efficiently. Um, and then there comes a time when you're trying to figure that out and you say, um, do you not, do you, what is a life worth? In other words, do you make a decision um, not to go forward in a direction which might yield um, a, um, as sure as it can be, diagnosis? Or do you say we don't have enough money and let people suffer and die? And that's a, that's a, that's a, a question that um, I think the Congress wrestles with right now. Um, and I, you know, I, I fall on the side of life. Um, but I was just wondering, when you hear all of this, uh, Mr. Farrington, um, you, you I, I guess your family history caused you to take extra precautions, is that right? I mean, did you, is that, I mean, in other words, Wait, see, like when you see a history like that, you, <laughs> my father, by the way, had prostate cancer. Yes. And I have many friends. I was in the bank uh, about a year ago, and I was amazed just standing there. One person comes up. He's talking about he just got out of the hospital, and then two or three more show up and come to find out it was seven of us standing around, and out of the seven of us, four had gone through prostate cancer. Of course, we were all around the same yes. uh, age level. But I was just wondering what... Uh, when you, I mean, what, what, what advice are you giving men? What are you saying to them? Well, number one, um, my fam family history uh, should have put me on alert, but very frankly, my doctor never had a conversation with me about prostate cancer, which is one of the real problems with some of the guidelines that are dependent upon that discussion between doctor and patient. A lot of doctors do not have that discussion, and they do not have it with black men at an early enough age to make a difference. I did not have that discussion with my doctor, which required me when I was diagnosed to, to leave Boston to, to get a specialized treatment. What, uh, what I am uh, advising men to do is to know their prostate health. Uh, and the only way that you can know your prostate health today <laughs> is through PSA testing and your digital rectal exam. And once you know your prostate health, if you find that you have cancer, then to understand your options. And those options may be to treat, they may not be to treat. We have talked men with Finn out of being treated for prostate cancer and told them that they're better off through active surveillance. So I think those are the things that need to be done, and, uh, but it, it does require uh, uh, some action on the part of the patient. You cannot stand back and, and gamble with your prostate. You cannot stand back and not be knowledgeable because that is the highest risk of death. That happened in my family last year. And uh, so those are the things that we're, we're, we're trying to foster a higher level of understanding and education. That saved lives. Yeah, I would also just like to add uh, one other point to uh, Mr. Iser's question about where we would uh, direct research. 
uh, I, I, I failed to point out that one of the key areas is in research to be able to distinguish between cancer that will kill and cancer that will not kill. I think those, that is a major question that we have today relative to research. You know, Ms. Gallo, thank you, sir. Um, Ms. Gallo, um, <clears throat> one of the, in my discussions with um, uh, a number of groups that address the issue of cancer in general, um, they say, and you, you alluded to this in your testimony, that when it comes to breast cancer, um, I think a, a lot of the attention that has been given to breast cancer is because there's been a very aggressive effort on the part of women. And um, the research has shown that women are more likely to go to a doctor than men. And, they, and, and so uh, with the, uh, all of the, the ca campaigns uh, for breast cancer, I think it has helped to elevate it to a, a level that um, NIH and others have to pay attention to it. And how do you see um, us raising this issue to the level of, of, of breast cancer when one out of every six families in the United States is affected uh, by this? And I was just wondering. To be honest with you, Congressman, I know a lot of it is the fact that we haven't taken the ability to really move get out there, as they say, the squeaky wheel gets what it's looking for. And in my 15 years of working with men, it's very difficult for them. Some of them don't believe they can make a difference. And I've explained to them, you know, I've been out there fighting this battle for 15 years. Sometimes it's difficult being a woman, but we really need to bring it to the forefront. And I think part of the problem with prostate cancer is we don't work directly with the researchers like we should, where the breast cancer coalitions do. Uh, we're lacking in a lot of areas, and it's, I hate to say that sometimes it's egos, it's, you know, whatever, but the bottom line is, as a woman, you bring the passion to the disease, and you say, you know, explain it to them, and that's why a lot of men that are prostate survivors have said to me and other women that they feel we're the ones that are going to make it happen, and that's why we started the Women Against Prostate Cancer, because we felt we, as women, uh, women that have lost their husbands or other, how, their survivors or whatever are planning to come down to the Hill, talk to the Congress, and tell them the importance of losing our husbands or the possibility of it happening. I mean, there's just so many issues with prostate cancer that goes beyond just what we're talking about here that affects the family. Um, that, again, as Mr. Farrington had said, the education is so important, we just don't have it. We don't have the education like we need to. And this is one thing I felt that I really wanted to hone in on, you know, t letting people know about what prostate cancer is, where they can go if they have prostate cancer. Like you said, you don't have to have it taken out because the first thing men want to do is get rid of it, you know. And that's not always the best thing to do for those people. So I feel that really the education is really important and we need to help the Congress to really be behind us and, and of course here are men sitting here that could have prostate cancer at one point and it's you that myself as a woman are advocating for such as these gentlemen here or any other men in my life, you know, so I'm here because I care, I'm here because my husband died of prostate cancer. Uh, I don't have prostate cancer, but it's been very upsetting to me to know that you could lose a man over this disease. And when it goes to the bones like it did to Dean, it is the most horribly excruciating pain that I cannot explain to you. He was working in Congress when he had the pain, and he had a brace on from a hip replacement, and he would walk over to the Capitol in excruciating pain. There was nothing we could do to make it better for him. So that's a concern I have, that we want to make sure they not, don't get to that point. But I just want to uh, give you another note here. Um, prostate screening, just so you know, was not included in the provided health care reform. 
and legislation and the problem it would do would, would wipe out the uh, prostate cancer screening available to over 30 million men in 37 states. So that's one thing I think when we go into the health care bill I think needs to be looked at that we don't overlook the prostate screenings and the importance of doing that. Um, you know, like Mr. Farrington said, if you really look at the numbers, uh, it was since the prostate cancer has been used as a tool, you have seen the death rate go down and the incident rate go up. Because even though more people are getting diagnosed, there's not as many people dying from it. So that's a good thing. So again, I think we really need the Congress behind us to really you know, be there and say we need to put more money into outreach, we need to put more money into finding a better tool to diagnose prostate cancer and just be able to do the best we can because I don't want to see our men lost to this disease. All right. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my first uh, question is to uh, Mr. Gossett. First of all, when I was a teenager, I, I was a very big fan of yours. One of the movies that I, that I watched and still remember was Iron Eagle, whether or not you remember it. I remember Iron Eagle. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> but that was one of, the mov one of my favorite movies during my teens. But I represent um, the city of New Orleans, and, oh uh, which is about, comprised of 60% African American. Yes, and, uh, and obviously prostate cancer uh, disproportionately affect uh, African American males. My question to you, uh, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to my constituents as to one, uh, how to, pre how to uh, prevent prostate cancer, and two, um, how, what, what, would, what would they do if they were to have it to fight prostate cancer since you are a survivor? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> it's some comics. Uh are, are saying that the prostate cancer to the African-American man, because of the way they have to be examined, is a surefire way of them to keeping it and dying with it. The examination. I'm sorry, can you, I, can, can you turn on these? The, it's, it's on. The examination of prostate cancer, especially in places like Louisiana, Detroit, places of the, of the macho African-American man, it turns him off. Because you know what you have to do in order to examine the prostate. It really, literally makes him put it aside put it in the back of his head and forget about it. As a result, more deaths happen because he does not want to go through the experience. You understand the experience I'm talking about? Right. With the rubber glove. And that's exactly the true reason why most African American men do not go to that. They need to get to the examination, need to put it aside and go for it. I had a little bit of that, but it's over because I really know how important that is. Now, in, once you know you have it, then they talk about and this is what I get from emails and faxes. A diaper, uh, incontinence. So that's a world that the African-American macho man does not want. So in his mind, he takes it, he puts it in a drawer, and next thing you know, it's incurable. We need to educate them. We do have to do deeper research to show them that it's a little bit more pleasant, it's more like a mammogram, to get them off that high horse. There's a fear, as you know, especially in Louisiana of not being able to make love to your woman again. I'm speaking in these real terms. That's why the African-American man, think, has more of incidences of prostate cancer than someone else, because he don't want it, he don't want to hear about it. He doesn't want to hear about not being able to make love, wearing diapers, and having incontinence. Those are real things, to, especially if he's poor, that's the last place he can express himself. So he takes it and puts it in his back pocket until it's a problem. Uh, Mr. Farrington, um, do you believe that we have done enough to inform uh, the African American community, the African American males, of the dangers of prostate cancer and the preventive measures uh, in connection with prostate cancer? Uh, absolutely not. I don't think we've uh, <coughs> done enough to uh, inform the high-risk community. And that's what would you recommend that, the high that risk, we should do? That's African-American men, men with a family history and, and some Vietnam veteran, uh, inform them about the risk and that the, you, the prevention to death is knowledge. I'm not sure there's a prevention to the disease itself, uh, but certainly the prevention of, of, of death is, is knowledge in early detection. Uh, what I would, uh, as I outlined in my uh, 
in my uh, testimony, uh, I'm a strong advocate of education. That's the reason I founded the Prostate Health Education Network. And what we are doing is that we are outreaching across the country through a number of means to the public. Uh, 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 we are outreaching through television, through online, and we created a, a survivor network of African-American men that can work on the ground in their community to talk with other men. As uh, Mr. Gossett pointed out, uh, there's a fear about the disease, but if a, if a prostate cancer survivor can touch another man and talk with him about the experience and say, I am here and I've survived and I'm whole, and you can do the same, but you've got to begin the process of, of knowing your prostate. Those are some of the things that we are doing. And uh, uh, just speaking with uh, Mr. Gossett, uh, we're starting this year a, uh, a nationwide uh, Father's Day rally in churches across the country. We did that in Massachusetts last year. And at Mr. Gossett's church in, in, uh, in Los Angeles, it just so happened, uh, the first book that I wrote, it was unveiled in his church uh, in Los Angeles. So uh, we're going to work together on some of these things for a higher level of public education. And my last question is to Mrs. Gallo. Um, what would be your recommendations to women? How can they encourage their husbands to, I guess, to be more open to the uh, to the procedure of uh, of prostate cancer cancer uh, detection, how 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 can you uh, encourage your husbands to to take those preventive measures in order to not to have to to, to suffer uh, this this disease? Well, nagging is always the first good thing you can do until they're blue in the face and, and had enough works. of listening to you. Sometimes it's making the doctor appointment for them. And the other part is saying to them, look at honey, I want you around for a while. And this is a very imp a, a disease that's out there that we ought to make sure you don't end up with. And I think that women nowadays, even the younger women, are becoming very... Um, no, are really learning more about prostate cancer and the need to get their husbands there. And I know that there are a lot of women that have basically dragged their husbands to the doctors. I mean, some may be a little bit more, you know, nice about it, but um, that's why, again, you know, we talk about education. Uh, my feeling is educating the women to go back and get their husbands because most of the time the women are the ones that, you know, drag the husbands to the doctors or, you know, are a little persistent about it. Um, and I think also I say, look, I, you know, the women go through exams every year. Look what we go through. Well, yours is nothing compared to what, you know, you, you know, we have to do. And again, it's, it's importance of saving your life. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you, for instance, at one point Dean said to me, well, if it doesn't work, shoot me, okay? Well, when it came to prostate cancer and his possibility of dying, that whole thing went out the window because the concern was he wanted to live. So I think people have to understand, and I don't think that we've educated men and women enough to understand the importance of getting you know, early detection and being able to treat it at an earlier stage. You know, it's 10, 12 years ago, well, 15 years ago, before, when before Dean died, there wasn't much out there. And I have seen such a difference, and even in this 15-year time, um, that, you know, there's different ways to be able to help through, you know, a lot of the times with the side effects and whatnot. But people have to understand, and if they don't tell them, then they're more upset when they find out after the fact that nobody talked to them about it. So I think we almost have to be kind of real now. We can't just beat around the bush, and I'm talking about like, like you know, Mr. Goss was talking about the side effects. You know, we don't want to talk about them, but it has to be talked about because when people go through it and find out these side effects exist, then it creates another problem. So um, I think it's more or less just getting women to really, if they really care about their husbands, they're going to get them there one way or the other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you very much. We are... Um, <clears throat> We are going to, um, first of all, thank you all very much for your testimony. You. We're going to adjourn now for about a half an hour. We have three votes. Um, and then uh, we will, this panel is dismissed, and then we will uh, come back and hear the second panel. But your testimony has been very, very helpful. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir. So Mr. We'll, Chairman. We'll be back in about a half an hour. Mr. Chairman, yeah. I just a uh, unanimous consent. I'd ask unanimous consent that my, uh, my full statement be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Thank you very much.